Alright, hey hey y'all. So today we're going to switch gears a little bit and take a look at Sarah Ahmed's first book, uh, Differences That Matter, Feminist uh, Theory and Postmodernism. Now this text, well actually I should preface this a little bit uh, about Sarah Ahmed for those that aren't familiar. She was a, considered a prolific writer, and very much so. She's written a, a number of books over the last, uh, this one was 98, so I guess 20 years. She's written a, a number of books, each of them very, it, it, she draws upon a pretty eclectic body of, body's work, which makes her very, very interesting to me. But she, she's one of the rare, rare examples of, of, a, of a thinker that matches her um, life to, to match her work. So a little bit more uh, of a backstory with her, uh, just from Wikipedia to put it as succinctly as I can find it. Uh, so in 2016, Ahmed resigned from her post at Goldsmiths in protest of the alleged sexual harassment of students by staff there. And then she, despite this, continues her work. Now this was a pretty big, uh, big move, considering the the number of allegations that were going on around the globe at that time, obviously, and uh, kind of the precursor to not not this act itself, but the way that these sorts of um, allegations coming out, work towards the Me Too movement, but really what 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 interests me most about this, not to say that that's not interesting in itself, but to have a, a tenured professor give up their position is is rare. Now more than that, she she runs a blog called uh, Feminist Killjoy, and she's on Twitter as well, and she makes her ideas, many of her works, uh, accessible for open access, which is something I very much enjoy. Too many people profit off of the distribution of ideas, so it's very nice to see that she uh, is throwing a wedge in all that, or throwing a wedge in the paper use industry. But, uh, you know, move into the, the te text itself now. This was her first book, and this is in the late 90s, so about 98, and it's it's an interesting book because for my own part, it's one that one would think, given the subject matter I've dealt with on this on this channel here, it'd be a book that I disagree with. But I think it's important to, even though there are aspects to this that I'm not, you know, fully in tune with, or perhaps I don't agree with, I think that it's nevertheless extremely important to uh, to be subject to that which can make someone uncomfortable especially for my own part, you know, the standard uh, philosophy bro reading, you know, all the big French names and, and German philosophers. It's really important to trouble that, I think. So that's what this book is, is gets at, essentially. And what she does really well is point to the extent to which many postmodern thinkers are extremely problematic. But at a almost at an analytical level, the extent to which their projects are not nearly as radical as they make themselves out to seem. So some of the figures that she takes on here will be Deleuze, you know, Guattari, Baudrillard a little bit, um, and really to sift out the moments in each of those thinkers that they are much more in favor of the system than actually in favor of dismantling it. Now, it, I, I do want to emphasize that it's, uh, it's difficult to swallow at times the, the, some of the uh, the ideas she puts forward here, but nevertheless, I think they're really important. So let's let's hop into it. So in her, in her introduction, she, she states this: "I have suggested that questioning postmodernism involves challenging both its assumed referentiality and indeterminacy. Such a question of postmodernism means an ethics of closer reading. My approach involves." getting closer to postmodernism in order to trace the particularity of its inscriptions. So at the beginning of that passage, when she states that there, uh, it's assumed, that is, postmodernism's assumed referentiality and indeterminacy, she opens up the domain 
to think about uh, postmodernism in perhaps one of its most in one of its strongest areas that is textuality so throughout the course of this book she'll look at many different uh, I guess cultural icons or cultural um, cultural symbols coming out in the form of films that for her have been or that she acknowledges in the uh, quote unquote postmodern community as being celebrated by them. So one of the films she takes on, for instance, later on, and we'll get to it in more depth, is, is a film like Blue Velvet that has been uh, praised by thinkers that may align with postmodernism, but that for her maintain in their theorization of the, the film in a certain way, or in the way that I will come to kind of expound upon, maintain a certain status quo. But it's a status quo that is maintained precisely by its indeterminacy in some way. Now this will all become clear as we go. I, I want to try and preface this as much as I can, and I know it's, it must be annoying to listen to, but the reason I do it is because this text is, is rather complicated. I think it's good to lay down something of a, of a foundation before moving into it. So her entire critique revolves around the question, what place does feminism have within postmodernism? So even those postmodern feminist approaches, in the time that she was writing this in the mid-90s, I'm familiar with a few other texts that were kind of sprouting up at that time because postmodernism was, I guess, hitting like a, like a peak and, you know, it, I think it would come down uh, following this. But not, this not as though this text necessarily was the deciding factor, but coming out of, you know, the Frankfurt School in the 50s and 60s, uh, postmodern thought, I guess in the late 60s and 70s, especially the 80s, really presented another uh, foray into a mode of thought. So it was around the mid-90s, early, throughout the 90s, I guess, when people were really, in my mind, in my reading, you can find earlier examples, starting to really criticize that. To what extent, posing the question, to what extent these texts rely on a certain gendered aspect that dismantles or disrupts its claim to radicality. Now the first chapter is called Rights, which is uh, a pretty poignant chapter title. And it begins with the question, in what space does feminism belong? She continues, it is this kind of question concerning belonging, concerning the proper space of feminism that has led to a representation of feminism as straddled between the contradictory demands of practice and theory. On the one hand, feminism has been identified as inherently modern, as a politics committed to emancipation, agency, and rights. But on the other hand, femini feminism has been seen to be pulled towards the postmodern, to the very critique of the ontotheological nature of such beliefs. And this is, this is something that really uh, continues on today where there is a desire, at least in the way that we construct certain narratives around uh, what it means to do theory, or to do philosophy, to do practice, that there is a split between these things. And the feminist doctrine coming out of um, I guess the late 20th century, notably that the private is the political, and vice versa, through, through a wedge in the easy splitting or the easy bifurcation between theory and practice. So it made it possible for us to consider what went on in theory as being very political and what went on in politics being in a sense very theoretical. So she, by opening up this question, is wondering why feminism has been placed in, in between as being either, you know, either it can belong to one or the other. Like, in that at, at, at most but it's really always kind of housed in a sort of indeterminacy within itself which has been a point it's been romanticized by occupying that position by certain postmodern thinkers um, kind of romanticized in its ambiguity and then used mobilized to to push a certain narrative so this chapter then focuses focuses specifically on the question of law and rights rights and um, and laws. So what she does specifically is take a look at, um, she examines how feminism, in her words, has 
an ambivalent and crit critical relation to the discourse of abstract rights at the level of practice, addressing three examples which embrace the diversity of both political and legal contexts. The use of rights discourse in the UN Conference for Women in Beijing in 95, models of re reproductive rights in the abortion debate, and, within Britain, feminist responses to the Child Support Act in 1991. So for Ahmed, the, the law, and she draws upon another text here, uh, a text by uh, Zilla Eisenstein titled The Female Body in the Law, where Ahmed um, states that Eisenstein argues here that the law is phallocratic, that is, it reflects the dominance of the phallus as a symbol of the male body in a social order that privileges the better or the bearer of the penis. So this um, proposal, the one that Ahmed draws from Eisenstein, notably that there is within the realm of the law a distinction between uh, the well, the law itself uh, marking the phallocentric and then whatever falls outside of it, or in those kind of subcategories of it, perhaps occupying the realm of the quote-unquote feminine, stands radically opposed to the, I guess, traditional idea, or one of the more conservative ones, that located within the law a split between the divine and the human. So in her words, the general critique of legal foundationalism, in which law finds its origin in the split between the divine and the human, takes place through the rendering of sexual differences secondary as merely one form of difference in a chain of differences which derive from the originary difference, divine and human. So it's that questioning that, well, what does that human look like? And it inevitably takes the, takes the form of a, of a male phallus-bearing individual. And it's not, uh, it's not unimportant that the, the same thing can be applied to the divine. God is very traditionally considered male. And in a proper Amidian kind of way, she then takes Eisenstein to task on this, where there was that distinction between divine and human, and forces us, in, in some sense, to question the um, supposed neutrality of either of those categories, and then she says, okay, well, if we problematize this and start thinking about the law in terms of like a phallus, to what extent then does that as well participate in this very system of oppression? So for, for Ahmed, she puts it as follows. In this sense, the phallus symbolizes the penis as a privileged mark of sexual difference, but here privilege comes bo both before and after the phallus. It is both already inscribed on the male body and a consequence of its symbolizing of that body in a specific economy. So really, it's for her, in the way she kind of uh, really gets at it, is that the term phallocentrism is a bit too vague, which for her simply implies the privilege, the privilege is a total and singular system, free from the contradictions and opaqueness that a relation of power would surely generate in the production of antagonistic subject positions. So it's kind of like that Foucauldian paradigm where there's power, there's resistance, and that works at the capillary level. So to think about Foucault in these terms, which is ironic given the subject matter of this text, um, you know, we think of the Foucauldian thesis of the web, or the web, or the, the kind of Foucauldian idea of the web, where power is something that exists on so many levels that approaches us from so many different uh, domains, it would seem odd to, in this context, to simply attribute the, the oppression to a single point, right? Then we would fall, it would be a sort of trompe l'oeil in that sense, like a trick of the eye that we would fall prey to, which is what Ahmed's coming to really get at here. So it is in that way that the palace is not some kind of transcendent mode of power, but it is always bound up within these contradictory, uh, struggling, antagonistic forces that make up, in a sense, not, well, not only the material conditions of reality or the material conditions of oppression, but the textual ones as well, that are bound up within codes of signification that are undoubtedly hierarchical, at least, at least for Ahmed here. So what potential then does a postmodern critique of rights uh, serve. 
or what, what kind of potential does it house? So she starts off thinking about this in this subsection by saying very, right off the bat, there's very little postmodern literature on the thing called rights, which is rights are, you know, if we think back, we think of the Greeks or we think stuff like that, which the postmodernists surely want to do away with, or at least problematize to some extent. So it's not a total surprise that, and she, I believe, correctly identifies that there is a general absence on this discussion around rights. So this isn't, this isn't uh, a crazy idea, thinking about the way in which postmodern thought very much likes to, tri likes to tri uh, trivialize or, or problematize the notion of there being kind of universal human conditions, or rights, or beliefs, or anything like that, it would make sense that they would be rather hesitant to try to open up a discourse around what would constitute rights or anything that would be uh, achieved at sort of a priori. So one text that she does turn to is, is one by uh, Derrida, um, the, the Force of Law. So in this, in this text, she picks out like a number of quotes, but Derrida, essentially what he does there, and it's been, it's been a while since I've read that one, but he points to the, uh, the aporias, and this is what she write, identifies in it as well, the sort of aporias behind the idea of justice or the law. So the law for Derrida is something that simultaneously does precisely what it professes to do, i.e. disseminate what is just and exert a certain um, degree of control or power in the maintenance of that thing called justice and, and work out the according or the uh, proper punishments for those people that break said laws and what have you. But at the same time, and this is where the aporia comes in, or the contradiction, is that for the law to do such a thing, it must in some sense be exposed to what exists uh, contrary to that. It must exist within a system that it can be, or outside of a system that it can be measured up against. So in this way, it's sort of like uh, how the body is able to inoculate itself from a virus. So it's by injecting some of the virus into itself that it is able to defend itself against an even greater threat from that same strand of the, uh, of the virus. So it's in that way that a thing like justice or the law, at least as it is perceived by Derrida here, who is for Ahmed representing the postmodern voice, at least for now, on this topic of law or of rights, this is how she wants to think about the sort of contradictory element indicative of the law that the postmodern thinkers come to have come to make make clear. Now she she locates this in relation to legal scholar Dworkin's Dworkin, I believe that's how it's pronounced, uh, their model, or his model I believe, where he states that laws are what come to be um, elected upon, and in that way it would be unjust to educate someone or to punish someone by retroactively constructing a law for which they can then be punished. Rather, there has to be a history to the laws so that they are fair in that way. So in every given moment that a punishment is laid out for, for breaking of a certain law, what you have is very unoriginal. And this is the term that she's she's taking out of him. You have to. It, it's very unoriginal in that it does not create a new law. Perhaps the punishment might vary between circumstances, especially if we consider something like race. But the law itself, because it has this history, it has this telos, does not change per se. So it is that this idea that stands opposed to the Derridian deconstructive idea precisely as, as we can think of it just before, there's always some kind of negotiation going on in the deconstructive moment, right? In that this split between what is acceptable in the judicial moment or in this thing called justice or in the rights of law or law, and then what stands opposed to it. And there's always that sort of, for the presence of that contradiction. So it's not so neat as to say that it has a history this history has a meaning, and it has culminated into this point. So in very much the same way as we did earlier, while Derrida's deconstructive approach would be something that we might, on first glance, see to be something that would align well 
with with feminist thought, especially in the destabilization of a, of a steady subject position or, or of a, um, a clear linear telos to this thing called law, uh, Ahmed wants us to even question that and say to what extent then does even Derrida's kind of bifurcation, Derrida's dichotomization between law, what stands outside of it, or between the calculable and the incalculable system and unsystem, in what way do these distinctions then evoke the sense of there being not only uh, a split between, you know, a thing like male-female, for instance, or in what way can then the outside be, you know, that Im the image of that indeterminacy be placed on women. Besides all that, to what extent is this simply sort of pie-in-the-sky type theory that doesn't have any pragmatic applications. So is, there is then, just very uh, blatantly st stated by Ahmed, there's simply an absence of a socio-historical contextualized and contingent analysis in the deconstructive uh, approach. So you have two extremes here, thinking about the one uh, put forth by Dworkin, which thinks about the way in which there is a history, but it is a very oppressive uh, you know, teleological history that is very much in the realm of this of patriarchal thought. And then on the other side, you have the total disavowal of any such possibility of contextualization. So it's, I will reluctantly say that Ahmed wants to find like something, it's not an in-between, that would be, that would be really wrong. Just a totally radical new way to look at it. So for her, there, there cannot possibly be fundamentally a connection between deconstruct and deconstruction and pragmatism. As for her, pragmatism cannot be simply added to deconstruction. It would involve its radical transformation. So that approach is really, or the one she's crafting, is one that considers the myriad of voices and people, folks, that have been excluded by these, um, by either of these systems of thought when thinking about the law. So feminism for her has located how the concept of abstract rights intrinsic to classic liberalism and traditional jurisprudence is necessarily exclusionary, revealing that the construction of a universal intrinsic right has entailed processes of selection and exclusion. So we can see here that it's not simply a disavowal of this thing called rights, but rather thinking about the way in which it has been constructed up until now for a very certain sect, for a very certain group of people, notably white, white cis, uh, hetero, middle-aged, to, uh, to elderly, to males, which isn't totally uh, unheard of. It, this, this isn't something that it sh should be becoming out of left field, considering the people who wrote down these things called laws fell into that, those categories. At least 99% of them did. So, in proper fashion, she wants us not n not only to say that rights are something that can be should should be extended to every single person, because it, it, for her fundamentally this idea of rights is always already bound within a very oppressive or hierarchical hierarchical um, systematization or system. So for her, the focus on rights is necessarily exclusionary, as necessarily marking out another means that feminism cannot simply reify rights as essential, or represent women's rights as intrinsically right and exhaustible. Now, this is a pretty radical idea, and it's very much a response to um, you know, the, that thing called second wave feminism, whatever that necessarily was, because it questions the extent to which there what there was permeating within those circles, a discourse around a certain truthfulness or a sort of, a sort of idea about, you know, women's rights, which of course is a good thing, but we have to question to what extent the, that, very, that very discourse participates in a system of exclusion. And it goes on today, the, like, the people st that still tout, you know, second wave feminist um, doctrine, but are very are, are extremely transphobic and are often still very very homophobic and, and biphobic 
and it's difficult to kind of reconcile uh, some of the stuff that, that they say. At least that, that's for me. So it's now that she, she turns to that example she gave her, one of the examples she said this chapter was going to be about. So um, the UN Conference for Women that was, that was held, for, uh, held in Beijing in, in 95. So for this, what this opened up for her was essentially the question around who was allowed to speak about women's rights and when did this desire to speak come about? When was it, I guess, when did it gain this traction? So this is made clear when she gives the, the example of uh, Susan Moore, Moore who, who wrote at the time that many other people have expressed reservations about the Beijing conference chief one being that it is held in Beijing, China. China is hardly known for its commitment to free speech or to women's rights. So for Ahmed, she, she wants to take a step back and say, whoa, 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 what right do we have as, as you know, at the time, well, even to this day, uh, for them to identify as Western feminists, what right do they have to look at someone in China and say, you, you barbaric type type individuals that, that don't respect these sorts of rights. For Ahmed, there, there's a lacking, to borrow a term from uh, Helen Hoy, uh, there's lacking a, an epistemic humility. So what is missing is the recognition of certain cultural differences, or certain differences that matter, that do impact the way in which pe people interact with one another and change the parameters of what goes on. Now this might seem to be like very much in line with the postmodern approaches, at least that kind of relativization uh, suggestion. But it's, I don't think it's anything of the sort. In fact, that it's really just wanting to op have everyone speak about what their positions are, allowing people to speak, rather than the, which stands opposed to the postmodern type approach that really just dictates how people are all different and that's it. And then there is a and a, a, a fundamental essentialism bound up within that, but we'll, we'll get to that a little more. So to return to what Ahmed does, that she critiques Moore here in this, in, in Moore's suggestion, because uh, for, for Ahmed, she believes that Moore invokes the idea that China is seen as the other in order to construct the rights of the West, after all, to focus on the abuses in an other culture is one way of authorizing one's own culture and one's entitlement to speak of such rights abuses. So then we need to reflect upon how the setting up of an international feminist agenda could involve the authorizing of the power of Western feminists to define the terms. So it's in that capacity that this discourse around rights, or as she continues, the use of rights discourse within the conference agenda hence marked out division and antagonism rather than a universal. Who has the right to authorize? What constitutes women's rights as human rights? And for us, we have to question, at least in this context, what does it mean? What, what idea is evoked when we think of the word women? So women's rights. I think inevitably we, it's always, you know, for the, well, for the most part, white, western, women in the, in the global north for the most part and it's their needs that are catered to in this way. So our first step then for Ahmed is the recognition of the incommensurability of feminist constructions of women's rights. So one example and, and a popular one that I still you know I hear today often enough is that is the one dealing with um, I guess I should I'll talk about um, here um, genital mutilation, so for um, a trigger warning to anyone that would be listening to this and, and is not prepared to hear this, J jump ahead maybe, or I'll see how far, jump ahead maybe three minutes and then it'll, you'll be right back into it. But to talk about this issue here, what she says is that it's not as though something like genital mutilation is not a Western feminist issue, it, it very much is, but rather what she states is that a more mutual engagement would require that one gives up the power to authorize what are the proper objects of feminist dialogue precisely by giving up one's power to authorize what constitutes human women's rights. 
So it's not so much saying that, actually, yeah, fine, do whatever you want, but it's about listening to the myriad of voices that are coming back, where it's not so simple as, it's not, it's not a one-way street in that way. There has to be some negotiation. There has to be an opening up of potential discourse that can allow for these differences to be recognized. So this idea goes on, and, and to talk about, uh, she, t she takes the time to think about abortion in this way, where she questions, okay, or well, she questions herself to some extent, she says, okay, I've laid out this, so far, the foundations to a thesis that suggests that we have to consider everyone in every way to have, you know, their own needs, their own idea about what constitutes rights, and so on. So then she says, well, could not that same argument be applied for a fetus in the case of, uh, in an abortion situation? So she says that it, it is, at least the way I read it, uh, it does seem tricky, and it's a tricky issue to get out of, but she says quite simply uh, that the person or the thing attached to or what she states actually is that a feminist approach may argue that the sociality of the subject, its constitution within and through the social itself, means that the fetus attached to the body of the social subject does not constitute a subject with proprietal rights. So it's in that way that she lays out, and this is all thinking, this is thinking subjects around a certain sociality. So it, about being bound up in a sort of, in its contextualization in time and space, in power relations that mark the body in that way. So to suggest that there can be something outside of that, and especially the discourse around being not born, being pre-determined in that way, in a sense doesn't make you human, at least, at least in the way that Ahmed is laying it out here, or not part of that social uh, apparatus where human is a social animal, a la Aristotle, if I'm going to be you know, per, perhaps giving a, a, an ironic example. So this brings us into the next example she gives when thinking about how rights in themselves obviously are something to be problematized. So she then thinks about the, um, the ROW, or the Rights of Women. So that this is the British Feminist Action Group that, that, that was, and it's titled ROW, or ROW for short. So she says that a cursory glance at a ROW bulletin would suggest that this word rights is used pragmatically as the sign which most effectively carries the weight of a political demand, being part of the pre-existing discursive economy of radical politics. Roe, that is, does not offer, in itself, a theory of rights. So, she goes on, the level of theory becomes at once a question of competing strategic, strategic, strategic sorry, organizations of the real, in order to examine how rights is used by feminist action groups such as Roe, I want to examine responses to the Child Support Act in Britain in 91. So, I'll keep reading this to give more context. The Child Support Act shifts responsibility for the maintenance of children from the state to the absent parent, setting up an agency to enforce collection. How has feminist opposition to this act involved the mobilizing of rights discourse? So, an article in Roe's Spring 1993 Bulletin draws attention to the structural effects of the Child Support Act on gender relations by evoking competing conceptions of rights. So the article begins by commenting on the procedure used to pass this act. It was introduced by statutory instrument and was hence not open to parliamentary debate. So this, uh, this institution, I guess, is for one of the main problems about it, is that, for the Child Support Act, is it normalizes the family and heterosexuality, so that women who choose to have children on their own or lesbian mothers are made invisible and illegitimate. So despite the title, the Child Support Act, it works to universalize and homogenize how rights operate and for whom they work for. So as she just mentioned, dealing with, um, I guess, the absent parent, suggesting in a sense that there is always this heterosexual bond that produces a child or that a child can only grow up in that setting, there is in this maintenance of rights still that exclusion of 
lesbian couples, gay couples that are very much capable of raising children. So this may all be read pretty pretty easily as, uh, or one response to this could simply be like, okay, well, you're just giving examples of generally conservative political uh, leanings or political actions that would inevitably butt up against uh, feminist thought. Like there are very few uh, feminist conservatives, at least if you that that fit in within the parameters of contemporary feminism. So, of this or to this this problem, um, in her very self-reflective way, Ahmed asks then, does it follow that the critical feminist model of rights is in itself right? So, she continues, this is not necessarily the case, as the very particularity of the feminist interpretation may suggest that it would not claim to saturate the discourse of rights, so that an all-inclusive right is made available. The focus on the erosion of women's rights defines the constitution of the right claim itself within the terrain of politics, whereby mobility is overdetermined in the form of relations of power. So it's not like there's this light at the end of the tunnel that can be necessarily achieved. At best, it's this kind of constant friction, this kind of constant resistance that works towards that sort of impossibility, if you will. Because inevitably, if a discourse ever were to arise that the project is done, that we've, you know, that we've done our job, then it would open up a whole other set of questions like, okay, at what, not only at what cost, but who is being oppressed in this, in this moment. There's a, there's a beautiful story, short story, beautiful, depressing, but um, it's called uh, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. And this, this is a really brilliant book, and I'll just summarize it really quickly, where there's a utopia. It's not a book, it's a short story. Where there's a utopia, perfect in every way. People use drugs only occasionally, and they only use it absolutely rec uh, recreationally. And there's, there's no crime, there's no poverty, there's no anything. Except beneath the city in a closet, or some kind of you know dungeon type thing, there, there's a small child who's suffering unbearably. So, the citizens of Almalas are all made aware of this at a certain age, in their, I guess, early teenage years, I can't remember exactly, or their late childhood, or at some point, at some point they're made aware of this child's suffering. Now, all the happiness somehow is predicated on this child's suffering. So when they are made to know about this child, they're given an option. Either they can stay in Almalas, or they can leave. Hence the title, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. So it's interesting in that way how this, you know, Ahmed really wants to resist the possibility of achieving, you know, an Omelas type situation, because that would be inevitably bad for her, right? Because it would surely rely on that child being in the closet somewhere, except it wouldn't just be a child, it would be a whole set of people, an entire race or, or gender, that would be excluded or precluded from the possibility of, it, of engaging within this thing called the universal rights of that perfect system. So it's in that way that she's, and I really like, like this about her, she's very, very self-reflective. So it is no coincidence then that these examples that she gives deals explicitly with, with questions concerning how women should act, how women should speak, in what capacity, you know, what capacity women should speak, and these are all questions that rotate around, um, you know, women's bodies that, that are most often posed by men, you know, not, no, no big surprise there. So for her, this, a, a solution comes out in this form, and, it, and it's really, she says it much better than I could, because she, she wrote the book, but she's 10,000 times smarter than me, where she says that feminism's use of rights discourse, now keep in mind that this is a you know, she's very critical of this idea of feminist rights, per se, as it can open up another, a whole other bad can of worms. She says, feminism's use of rights discourse entails an embodiment of the very concept of right. She continues, this process does not take the bodies of women for granted or obliterate differences between women or differences between feminisms. So here she's really outlining the importance of that thing called intersectionality, where just like the term rights is, you know, 
housed or or it contains a great deal of, uh, of problematic assumptions regarding who the rights are saved for. Feminism itself is is no different. Well, perhaps it well it's a little different, but it has many of the same issues. Where feminism has become associated with a certain whiteness, a certain class, a certain gender, absolutely. That we have to be careful of, which is why I think it's important. You know, she's invoking uh, feminisms here, feminisms that come from a myriad of different of different places. Simply put it simply, intersectional feminism here. So this is ultimately in the service of opening up feminism struggle to transform power relations in historically specific contexts, which involve a challenge to and destabilization of both modern and postmodern conceptions of rights. So that, that closes off this chapter here when she says that it hasn't really been about postmodernism yet. And I think it's a really interesting place to start because it's um, it, it deals very much with the material conditions of, of being. Because it would be, well, material conditions, the, the real situations that women as one, one marginalized group find themselves confronted with in this domain of the law. So it's a good place to start, because if she had just approached this book with, like, another uh, opposing discourse to postmodernism or anything like that, she would risk you know, co committing the same mistakes, where there, there are no real women attached to it, there are no real people attached to it. It's just total um, fantasy thought that doesn't have any real pragmatic attachment to it. So it's in that, uh, on that note, I like, I w I w I'm surprised it took me that long to get through. There's a lot here, and I, this will probably take me quite a few uh, talks to get through, because it's, it's also, it's, um, there's a lot of like social science stuff to this, and I'm not as used to speaking about these things in that way, where there are a good number of examples, and, and there is a very, it feels kind of social science-y, uh, that make it, makes it kind of difficult to work, to work and present, because there's so many facts and so many, so many details. But yeah, on that note, I, I hope that you'll tune in for the next ones, because I'm going to have to run through all of these. Hopefully I'll be able to put a couple of chapters together in a, in a couple of parts. And I think when it gets more into the postmodern stuff, I'll be able to ad-lib a little bit better. But anyways, for those that listen this far, I hope you got something out of this. I, I always like returning to this text. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's difficult. It's, it, there's no questioning that. But if anyone has any questions or has any problems with what I said, please, you know how to leave it. And for now, take care.